So we have with us Mr. Vijay Desai, who is a labor lawyer and a human rights activist and one of the founders of Human Rights Law Network. He brings with him a wealth of experience in labor litigation. And we'll be speaking to him about the challenges that the discipline of labor law faces right now, especially in the context of labor adjudication. One of the things that I'd like to start off our conversation with is the whole question of freedom of association and unionization, given that that's been pretty much at the foundation of legal rights when it comes to labor and the working classes. And we find that over the last few years, the right to strike and the space available for strike has been shrunk. Now, given that, are there any ways in which, from a legal perspective, we can try and think of strategies through which we perhaps would be able to reclaim the space that was available for strike and other forms of labor assertion in the past? Uh, right to strike was held in 1962-63 by the Supreme Court to be not a fundamental right, but it was a statutory right. It is a statutory right uh, which requires certain parameters of procedure to be followed in order for it to be held to be valid and justified because uh, uh, these are the two aspects which need to be, uh, need to be proved when you, also, you go, go, go on strike then the management can at times go to the court asking for stay on the strike etc. Mm -hmm. And at times you will have to prove that it is not only valid procedurally but it is also justified in the context of the demands you are making. Uh, in the, the 90s, there was a judgment in the, the case of Rangaraj, which uh, essentially applied to public sector employees. But uh, the court held that the workers, especially in public sector, do not have either legal, constitutional, or moral right to strike, which was, uh, which was I think, a regressive step. Because, yes, the earlier the courts had held it was on fundamental right, but the statute protected it. By this method, what happens is the justifiability of a strike becomes very difficult to do. So that's that's one aspect which we must uh, bear in mind. Uh, I think we need to uh, we will need to battle it out both at the level of legislature and in the level of courts okay, uh, to get the Rangarajan uh, reverse or confined to public sector so that uh, judges don't apply it to private sector. <laughs> Second thing is get I think stronger protection for right to strike in the legislation, okay, especially industrial disputes act which deals with right to strike. So the battle will be will have to be at that level because the courts must courts have to recognize that workers who like to go on strike, they go on strike because they are compared to go on strike. By and large that is the case. So even this justifiability thing, okay, which is again a judicial creation needs to be dealt with. Once it's procedurally valid, then well, that it was not justified, it has to be proved by the management rather than the workers trying to prove that it was justified. That is how I feel it should be. One of the earlier persons that we spoke to, he pointed out that because of this concept of justification, even though strikes are permitted under ID Act, practically in very few cases, you can actually claim any wages in cases of strike. So would you call for removal of this doctrine of justification given that it's not there in the I, statute at all? I would definitely, mm -hmm. and as I said, I would definitely do that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you have a procedure, you violate the, uh, you violate the procedure, uh, you are out, you won't get wages. But what happens with uh, justifiability, apart from the wages part, even if a strike is valid, and if the court holds it is unjustified, then you can be personally charged for misconduct and can be thrown out of the job. So it has it is a repercussion larger which goes beyond the wages. That is how I and also there are quite a few public sector undertakings, public sector utilities or even private sector, uh, where ESMA is applied many times, essential uh, special which prohibits rights all together. Mm -hmm. So you have a, uh, you have that kind of a regime right now. Mm -hmm. And taking a step back from strikes to the very question of unionization, and you also pointed out in your presentation earlier in the panel that the 2001 amendment made the whole question of unionization even more difficult. In that context, do you think it's possible 
for unions from the informal sector to get registered under the Trade Unions Act? See, uh, there are two problems for informal sectors. One is of course the new trade union, the amendment, because earlier any seven persons could get together and form a union. Now we require at least ten percent uh, of the uh, of the workforce or hundred uh, hundred workers, whichever is less, to form a union. That's that's one. So that becomes itself a difficult task. Second thing is of course you can't in an informal sector etc. Because the workers are scared, they would like to join a union which is run by outsiders. Now there is a gap on that as, to, uh, as far as unions are concerned, how many people can be from outside in terms of the committee and all that. So these are two factors which will come in the way. The second, as uh, the second aspect as far as this is concerned is of course that uh, in any case, I personally feel that unless there is protection to your employment, people get very scared in forming a union. Because once the management comes to me, you are forming a union, you are thrown out of jobs. Mm -hmm. And that is a fear which is a very, very valid fear in the mind. So protection of employment is also equally important for, for unionization to take place. On a related theme, Maharashtra is one of the few states where you have had a law on recognition of trade union, right? Whereas in most of the states, even now, we don't have one. But in practical terms, how much that recognition has made difference in strengthening collective bargaining? To a certain extent, initially, at least in the first 20 25 years, it made a difference in the sense that uh, it made compulsory of collective bargaining with a recognized union. Recognition had to be proved by going to the court, proving that you have a minimum 30% uh, membership, etc. Et uh, but once you did that, then the management was obliged to bargain with you. And uh, that had certain, uh, of course, then there were management floated unions and all those issues did come. So in the first 30 years, uh, the Act came in 71, so, uh, so till, till the late 90s, it made a difference. But after that, uh, the whole uh, unionization itself has gone down. So uh, according consequently, the recognition applications etc. have also gone down. And in this respect, I also wanted to speak to you of a question that we found with when we did our study with the unions from the informal sector and they often spoke of the need for forming alliances between sectors and ensure that workers are able to put together a much more collective front. From a lawyer's point of view, do you think is any, there is anything that can facilitate that process of building cross-sectional alliances? Uh, as I said, in terms of union, trade unions, uh, you can be an industry-wide union which can, and, and there is nothing which prohibits Permanent workers and contract workers for being part of the same union. So you can be part of the same union. Of course, there are conflicts mm -hmm. because the management plays divided uh, uh, kind of a policy right? where they give something to the permanent workers, provided they give up the demands vis a vis the contract workers. So that happens. But legally, uh, there is no prohibition. Okay? Uh, it has been tried in various ways. It's not that it has not been tried, it has also succeeded in some places. Where I know in Bombay, for instance, Hindustan, you know, various other unions, Siemens, etc., they did have a very, very strong collaboration with contract workers. But uh, let me put it this way that these efforts have mainly been in the same establishment or in the same industry. At cross industry or cross establishment, it has been very, very difficult. So, if we need to bridge the gap, what are the strategies that you think might be useful? I personally I don't know whether I'll be able to answer that question about what strategies will be useful. I, I, but I feel it's important that trade unions, uh, which are stronger, uh, which are of the organized class, have to play the leading role in this because uh, you can't expect the unorganized or informal sectors to. Second thing is the alliances can be at a couple of levels. It doesn't have to be only in the level of being part of the same union. You can have separate unions, you can have separate organizations, but still you learn a lot of issues. Now that is something also which doesn't happen so much. You know? the, 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 the division of the working class is so much that it is not uh, uh, you know, happening. But I, I personally feel that trade unions in the organized sector will have to pay. Now, again, talking about unionization in the informal sector, ILO in its report on decent work in the informal economy, spoke of how unions have to reorient themselves 
and often become service providers, often become partners in policy making. And to that extent, they become more relevant where perhaps traditional collective bargaining may not happen. At the same time, there are some who believe that this will weaken collective bargaining. So, what would be your views on this? I think it's worth trying out the method suggested by Ayano. Uh, it was tried out very effectively in the Chhattisgarh Mukti Mojo and the union which was there. When, when they did not only provide uh, like the classical traditional trade union work of uh, you know getting some protection for the workers at the workplace, but also providing a hospital outside, providing you know, uh, so it, I think it's more important. It's a, it's important that uh, trade unions play a role which goes beyond the workplace and uh, thereby uh, you know become part and parcel of the workers' lives. <laughs> then I think. Moving forward becomes easier. How much it is possible, I don't know, but I can. But I would look at it as a, as a very strong possibility. And one of the things that came up during our presentation and one of the highlights of our research has been the fact that there are so many exemptions, there are so many threshold clauses, etc., which means uh, almost, and as you said, more than 90% of our workforce is outside any form of labor protection. So, if you have to think of three or four very effective concrete measures in terms of statutory changes, what would you think of? I would first of all remove all clauses which require that only if certain number of workers are employed in an industry will it be covered by the factories or ESIA or PF. They are different, they provide for different, when you use power so much, when you don't use power so much, etc. But I personally feel that that should be done away with A. The wages, especially at the supervisory level, okay, where the where the law says that if you if you are earning more than ten thousand rupees, then you are excluded. I think that is the other thing which needs to be done. And the third thing I feel, which is very important, say industrial dispute sector, the right to employees to directly approach the court should be. It shouldn't always be through the conciliation uh, uh, procedure because more. More often than not, that's the case. But do you think the 2010 amendment, uh -huh. which allowed direct approaching of labor court after 45 days, has it had any impact at the? It has had. You see, uh, I'll tell you my experience is of is of Maharashtra mm -hmm. much more. And in Maharashtra, there was already a law okay. which so allowed you directly. Uh -huh. uh, so people always use that law. Okay. So outside, how much the difference it has made, I may not be able to comment fairly. Right. I had a couple of other questions, a little more fundamental. And all of us have to confront this question of informalization of work and technology will also further enabled it. And in this context, can labor rights have any meaning? Or do we say that we put a complete stop on use of contract labor? Then do we say that we put a complete stop on casual labor? And if not, to what extent would existing labor rights have any weight? I personally feel that labor law can never become completely useless. It, it has to be used and it will be useful. Uh, there are a lot of problems with the labor law. Uh, law is such a, I mean, apart from the fact that reality and uh, paper, on paper that uh, things are different, uh, quite a few problems are because of judicial interpretations, uh, such as on the issue of casual workers, such as the issue of contract workers, contracting out, those judicial interpretations need to be challenged through the courts, uh, uh, through the courts, and hopefully, if those change, for instance, if contract workers get their rights, then uh, obviously I can't say that if I call somebody to paint in my uh, office, that painter becomes my permanent employee. Obviously, I I, I, I can't argue that. So he would be a contractor, or he would be a contract employee. But when there is permanent work involved, then to hire contract. One contract purpose is something which I personally feel we should go with. It. And in the same way, if you look at most of our labor legislation, all of these are predicated around this tripartite model, state being this neutral arbiter. So, industrial disputes are allowed reference only by the appropriate government or through the conciliation officer, etc. But now, when we see the state's role itself changing, the state itself sees itself as an enabler and facilitator of business. Do we need to rethink all our design of law and perhaps take away the role of the state from some of the I 
huge say in taking away the role of the state uh, because whatever be the limitations of the state and which I see many increasing whatever be the limitations of state at least it provides you an arena to battle okay arena to uh, uh, to fight out okay? arena to struggle uh, a direct exposure of the employees to the employer, to the capital would in my submission be a different way. So yes, we need to rethink the models, but I would say complete withdrawal of the state from uh, this uh, is uh, something which is desirable. And la my last question relates to some of the critique that sociologists who work in this field have put forth, that we have got so bogged down with legislation and cases, and the entire model of industrial relations and dispute settlement is a technical, is a legal model which tries to see these as technical disputes rather than seeing it from the point of view of power struggle between workers and capital or see it from the point of view of the social and political history that goes, that went behind labor movement. As a lawyer, how exactly do we translate that critique into legal changes if you have to respond to that? See, I would tend to agree with uh, that ultimately it's Legislation is, labor legislation is nothing else but ossified class struggle. Mm. Okay, at a given point of time, and then it changes depending on how, how you are, uh, uh, how society changes. Okay. So in that sense, it's a very technical uh, approach to a problem which is, which is much beyond, uh, uh, you know, uh, this right to one worker, this right to another worker. I also feel that labor lawyers have failed uh, first of all, we have also been in tune with the changing times. Mm -hmm. And when I say in tune with the changing times, in the sense that uh, you are having a situation uh, whereby the traditional method of enforcement of labor laws are not working effectively. I always say that uh, labor lawyers should equally be competent or should at least be familiar with, say, corporate law. Thing. Because you should, uh, I mean, how do you get the management to the bargaining table? Right? You can use various other avenues, okay? whether it's corporate law, whether it's consumer law, whether it's some other, you know, use those avenues. But unfortunately, labor lawyers have been labor lawyers okay, in this country, so they don't know beyond that. Right? So I, will, I always tell people who are working with me that please look at everything because uh, there are various other methods. We are still in a very elementary stage of trying that out, but I, I feel you one needs to expand, uh, expand this open. You know. Well, the point is to exact leverage on the okay. how do you get the bargain? Exactly. Uh, that's a great note to conclude this discussion, and really grateful for you to thank you so much. Thanks. So the points you made about looking at a more innovative approach and a more comprehensive approach to law in order to secure labor rights, I think is a very important takeaway for any inspiring people. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks.